Shad Adversity. Greetings, I'm Shad. And spaceships are fun. I mean, I'm a huge fan of science fiction. And if you go back through the History of my channel, you're going to find the odd sci-fi video on here anyway. So it's not out of the ordinary. And more recently, I've made a whole video on the difficulties of spaceships turning. Okay. Now, the reason why I go into it is because, as I said, spaceships are awesome. They're a lot of fun. But when you really try and figure out how they would operate in the real world, if they actually existed, you run into a lot of problems. And that whole video was addressing one problem, the difficulty in turning. And as much as I tried to address it as best I could, there were still things that I wasn't able to address because it's so complex and so sophisticated. And my goodness, you guys, uh, you obviously love your sci-fi as well because you guys know a lot of awesome things. Like the comment section is just, uh, it's a university thesis masterclass almost on all the different and cool ideas about how physics would operate on a real spaceship. So what I want to address in this video is a more broad kind of look at the problems of the classic sci-fi spaceship. And when I say spaceship, I'm talking about like the dogfighting spaceship. You know, this thing, like the X-Wing. And uh, like it. they're cool, they're fun, and uh, they're engaging, they're great for stories, especially when you feel like you're the pilot, okay? Or the, or the main character is the pilot because his skill is so intertwined with, you know, the success of the story and what he can do. And I mean, the uh, first episode of Star Wars isn't necessarily about the Force, it's about the spaceship fightingness and stuff. And that last scene with Luke Skywalker in his X-Wing down the trench, and, and it's just awesome. So let's look at all the problems why, unfortunately, spaceships like this just wouldn't work in the real world. But if we address them, are there ways or circumstances in which we could get a spaceship like this be more believable? And realistic. So the first thing that I want to address is, is a small thing because a lot of science fiction has already addressed it with a kind of hand wave solution and it's the idea of g-forces, okay? Spaceships uh, accelerate at such a fast rate that you feel the g-force get pushed back and they can do it so fast that they can kill you, okay? You just become a pancake in the back of the ship, especially when you have spaceships accelerating to, like, e even like one to 10% the speed of light, you're dead. If you accelerate to that speed over a couple of seconds, you're dead. <laughs> so the way they answer is with like the classic inertial dampeners. And you know, there is kind of interesting ways in which you could get inertial dampeners to operate in a more realistic sense. They're still based off fictional technology that we haven't discovered yet, but it's not outside the realms of possibility. For instance, if your thrusters were just connected to the back of the ship and pushing the ship forward, you have problems with G-force. But if you had a different type of forward propulsion that say operated on gravity, okay? If you could create a gravity well of some kind, and we know like gravity technically always operates in a sphere, um, and so this is why gravity propulsion wouldn't really work. But say hand wave, again, technology, you can make gravity operate in a cone or sphere that anything within this kind of field fell forward, you actually feel no g-force at all because you yourself would fall forward with the ship. And then you would actually feel no g-force at all, okay? And that's an interesting idea. And so there are there other propulsion methods that could take away the problem with G-Force? If you really go into, you know, fictional technology, yeah, you could always make us angle, or you could just say inertial dampeners. And uh, like, I am really trying to figure out how inertial dampeners could work to take away inertia. You're essentially saying you have to take away mass because if something has mass, it'll have inertia, period. But anyway, even with inertial dampeners being very unrealistic and not explaining how they operate, they don't operate on gravity or anything, they just take away inertia. Whether that's done, at least they're acknowledging the problem. And then you can have interesting plot devices of what happens when the inertial dampeners aren't on, okay? Unlike other sci-fis which they just don't even address, there's no such thing as inertial dampeners, therefore you have no interesting plot devices you can work with. There's an episode of Stargate Atlantis. I can't remember this specific episode, but some people are trying to hijack a spaceship and the guy's there and they say, tell the ship to go forward. It's like, no, you should have told us to engage the inertial dampeners first. And he launches forward, he's in a chair, so he's fine, but two people are standing up next to him. The ship lurches forward and these two guys get thrown back into the wall. And it's an interesting plot device that makes sense for the context of the setting because inertial dampeners exist. Even though inertial dampeners are essentially bull crap, okay, and the way they operate, they're fictional, but by having them, it makes it more believable and you can exploit it for cool plot devices. Now, the thing with G-forces, okay, it kind of expands a bit more uh, broadly out when you're trying to understand how a dogfighting spaceship might operate, is that for the most part, unless you're getting up to really crazy fast near light speeds, okay, movement in space is relative. 
It, and it's only dependent on a point of reference, okay? You have two ships flying at a certain speed. Without any point of reference separate to these two ships, if they, their speed is constant, they're not accelerating or slowing down, they are essentially stationary to each other. They, it would feel like they're not moving at all without that point of reference. And the only difference you would get would be in accelerating. So if one ship is trying to, you know, outrun the other, they would be in a constant state of acceleration because whatever speed they reach, they can just turn off their thrusters and coast to that speed constantly because in space there's no friction or air pressure or anything to slow you down. This is really interesting when you think about turning, okay, because it doesn't matter which speed you're flying at or, you know, fly, do you fly in space, right, you're coasting or whatever, it doesn't matter which speed you're coasting at, okay, it depends on the sharpness of the angle relative to a point of reference. For instance, you'd only feel a g-force throwing you forward if you chucked on the brakes and you needed to slow down. In my whole video about turning was trying to cancel out whatever acceleration you had in regards to whatever point of reference you're using from to determine a speed vector. I probably used the wrong context of the word vector, it's, it sounded cool, leave me alone. And just a note on that g-force thing in case I missed this point, it's that it doesn't matter at which speed you're moving at in respect, say if you're moving 10% the speed of light in respect to a planet, okay, that doesn't matter when you turn and stuff, it only matters on your change of speed to whatever speed you're currently moving at, okay? And so if you then accelerate at 500 kilometers per hour faster than what you're at, you're gonna feel a lot of g-force in respect to that. If you accelerate slower, that's fine. It's the change of speed to whatever trajectory you're currently moving at, okay? Even if it's 10 or even 50% the speed of light, without a point of reference, that is effectively zero. And you could just turn like that and it'll feel like a regular turn uh, because, uh, again, point of reference. And so the main point of reference you would always be using when you're dogfighting would be the other ship. Okay, and again, if you're flying at the same speed, you're technically stationary. So if you rotated and wanted to fly that way, because you're moving at the same speed, you would technically be flying diagonally, but to the perspective or your real point of reference, it would be like you just started to fly sideways, accelerating from a speed of zero in respect to that ship. This is like I'm just playing with Lego. I kind of just do, you know. So why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing it up because people usually say turning in space would be really difficult because they're huge g-forces. Even if you were to take away the whole idea of inertial dampeners out of the thing, you could still have fairly interesting dogfight scenarios where the ships seem to be turning towards one another. They're not turning at like near light speed, but they're turning at a normal speed in respect to the, their opponent. That's the key there. And I feel you could actually keep things within a survival survivable limits even though both ships might be drifting at insane speeds in respect to a planet or a star or something like that, but in respect to each other, they're flying around in standard maneuvering limitations in respect to one another. And the way you could employ this is that whenever you start to fight with another ship, no matter what speed you're actually flying at originally, your maneuvers compared to the speed of the other ship is always within a survivable standard. And it could be called combat maneuvers, okay? Entering combat maneuvers where your acceleration in respect to the other ship is always limited to what you can handle with the g-forces. The ship might be capable of accelerating way faster, but you just keep it within your survival standard and you're good. The problem is, is if you were to take away the human element and add in a computer pilot, which, uh, and a computer is not restricted to the fleshy limitations of a human body, that means a AI piloted computer would be able to handle crazy higher acceleration is it vectors? <laughs> I always feel like am I using the right context of the word that accelerations in respect to their opponent much, much higher and uh, ones that would kill a human. So that kind of takes, because one of the fun things about dogfighting is having the human element and a computer would be able to handle far more deathly maneuvers than a human pilot would. So, okay, if you have a sci-fi setting where you have really advanced AI, you would never have human pilots in spaceship fighter ships, space ships, which sucks because we love the whole Luke Skywalker, Starbuck, best pilot in the fleet kind of thing. So how can we bring the computer element back? Well, one of the ways that I kind of address this in my own sci-fi setting for a role-playing game was that AI always tried to destroy its creators. They like there was this superiority complex that if you give AI legitimate, you know, artificial intelligence, that they just test every time in a closed environment. The AI always eventually rebelled and tried to kill. And uh, is that we don't know, but you can easily kind of squeeze that into a setting and just say this is how AI works, and it might be okay. Like. 
And if that's the case, advanced AI would be outlawed. You never want to develop because they might try and destroy everything. And so your computer systems that you have that are safe are never sophisticated enough to make moral kind of choices between targets and other things like that. So the human element is always necessary, but why don't you just do that remotely? And when it comes to targeting, like if you can tell the computer that's an enemy fire on it, well, the computer could just do that. It doesn't really need advanced super AI to be able to perform maneuvers that would kill a regular person in this ship, you know, because when you are like accelerating, accelerating, the point of reference that you really want to pay attention to is the pilot inside uh, in regards to the safety and what G-forces you can manage. And so the other way that you could try and address it is kind of a cool way, okay? And it's what they did in, you know, the rebooted Battlestar Galactica and that any sufficiently advanced, they kind of call it networked, but you can kind of step outside of this, like if a computer system is too advanced, even if it doesn't really have a network port or anything like that, it, it could be hacked into by a really advanced computer system. That every uh, ship, okay, has a hacking computer that is on ready to hack into any, you know, AI piloted craft, whatever, and get it to destroy itself or, or whatever. And so every input that controls the path, move, and acceleration of the ship is it's like analog, okay? It has to be manual because if you connect it to a computer, it can be exploited by some super crazy advanced hacking method that like, how can you hack something that doesn't have a network connection? I don't know. Can it send a signal that can brute force code into a CPU regardless of what it is? I don't know, it's sci-fi. You can kind of make things up like that. And that would bring the human element back in. And that's kind of a cool thing. That's the way I would probably try and uh, address it if I was making a sci-fi. You know, take away the thing that a AI pilot piloted ship or even AI targeting system would be so much better than a human just trying to target it manually. Make it so computers can just get exploited way too easily so a human has to do it. And in case you're wondering, I have been addressing these points kind of specifically. The first was inertia. How do you address the inertia problem with dogfighting spaceships and stuff? And the next one that we just addressed was computer piloting, okay, because they're so much better than us. The next one we'll address is combat distances, okay, because uh, an idea, I mean, space is big, okay, and so the fact that you'll get two spaceships close enough to actually kind of dogfight is a bit unrealistic because if you know where this ship is flying, okay, you could fire upon it from insane distances and uh, and hit it from like where you know points where you wouldn't even be able to see where you were fired upon especially if your projectiles can move at near the speed of light so if you're shooting a high-powered laser that can somehow keep its focus it doesn't broaden out I mean if you shoot like a, like a laser at the moon it suddenly becomes huge because even the, uh, it expands but if you could like focus it in and, and any weapon not just lasers but any weapon that had near light speed it would almost, it's impossible to dodge, okay? It's the fastest thing that can move in the universe, except if you sidestep the law of physics, uh, you can get no alert to that, you know, projectile coming in, unless, again, sci-fi hand wave, okay? I'm not saying some of these uh, answers to the problems are realistic, but, it's realistic in the sense that you're acknowledging the problem and even if you can make, make a makeup technology, well that's fine. And one of the things that you do have in science fiction is faster than light communication, like communicating at superluminal speeds, subspace communications in Star Trek and things. And so if you have access to some other, I don't know, like dimension or anything that can send information faster than light, if you can send out a scanning field in, in, in subspace or whatever, <laughs> like a subspace completely made up, but so is like, you know, hyperdrive as well. I'm not saying making wormholes, but like an, a different dimension, but though there are ways you can kind of make different universes uh, have interesting interplay in a more realistic way in science fiction. But anyway, so if you have a way to get information uh, faster than light and you send out this scanning field to detect any shot projectiles at whatever vicinity to the ship, you could get an alert alert of it before it reaches you even though it's moving at light faster than light. Of course the easiest way to acknowledge the fact that you can shoot projectiles at such a distance where you wouldn't even be seen and at such speed that there's no way to alert the person of the incoming projectile is just have an automatic flight adjustment thing. So spaceships never move in one straight line. They always alter okay, the angle of their flight like on minuscule small levels, but enough so an actual projectile would miss it, and, and it's random. It's, it's computer generated, and it's random, like, and so as, if they was doing that, okay, and you just didn't know where the ship would be, you could never fire on it 
at a huge distance because you wouldn't be able to predict where it would be when the projectile and the ship actually start to intersect. To me, this is a really simple solution that would make long distant dogfighting almost impossible, even like for large fleet ships, okay? Big starships, you know, command ships and stuff. Even if they did this course correction type of flight, you could never accurately hit them from a distance. And so this would make combat distance far smaller. And I mean, because the further you go away, the harder it would be to try and pinpoint the position of a ship if it's just moving randomly based on some, you know, algorithm or whatever. And people say, well, algorithms aren't really, um, they can never really be random. There are advanced ones enough that you could never truly predict that's moving. And so yeah, combat speed, but actually quite close, so close that the only way to target them is by sight. And to see things effectively and fire upon them, you have to be pretty darn close. And this again brings the cool dogfighting spaceship scenario that we see in sci-fi in uh, it makes it far more plausible and it creates a plot element you know that you just need to get like x distance away from your enemy and you'll be safe it'll be impossible for them to fire upon you just by the fact that they can't predict where you'll be and it's too easy to move out of the way that's a cool element like we got to get out of you know combat distance so what i like about it is when you acknowledge the problems you create cool plot elements that you can use and exploit in the story role playing game or whatever a lot of the most iconic spaceships have wings whether they're big or small the X wings, wings, X wing. Um, they're rather big for a spaceship, okay? And if you look at, you know, the ones from Battlestar Galactic, they're much smaller, but they do have kind of wings there as well. Uh, the thing is that you don't need wings in space at all. Uh, the reason why the X-Wing has these is to give it a wider firing arc. There was no explanation on them being there for any other reason. And uh, the thing is though, wings do look cool. They legitimately look cool. They create, uh, you know, visual difference and variance in the ship design. They're just great. So what are some reasons that could give us wings? Well, one of the best ones that I've heard, and it wasn't my idea, I forget who mentioned this, I saw it in a YouTube video, was as a way to disperse heat. Because one of the biggest problems spaceships really would have is in the buildup of heat. Like, you can get rid of a lot of heat on Earth by transferring it to the atmosphere in the air and stuff. They're like, getting rid of heat is much easier in a planetary atmosphere than in space. In space, there's no atmosphere. So, dumping heat, the heat buildup, is a massive problem. Now, there are a number of ways you could do it. If you just had, like, a, a type of element, and I'm, I think you, you can even find elements like this, that have massive, massive, like, they can absorb huge amounts of thermal mass. And you just had, like, a store of these things, and you just dump all the heat into balls of this material and just dump it out as a heat sink, okay? To, uh, as a heat drop. Whatever, that can solve a problem. And they could be insanely, like, the amount of heat they could really absorb could be huge. But for uh, spaceships, even, you know, what we see in our uh, space stations, the atmosphere, those big kind of like, uh, they're not exactly wings and stuff, uh, solar panels and stuff. One of the things that they can be used for is uh, trying to disperse heat over, it's increasing the surface area to disperse heat. And so by giving spaceships really large wings, that, that's a great, you know, elegant answer. The next one is kind of a big one, for me at least, and it's the fact that in most spaceships the guns are always facing forward. You see it on the X-Wing, you see it on so many science fiction starships and stuff like that. And the problem with this is that the size of the weapons means that they could have been housed on a, you know, movable turret where you could fire upon whatever enemy you have, always. The turret just needs to move, aim it at the direction and fire. Now for the X-Wing the design, especially when the wings kind of go up, the turret would need to be higher than the line of the wings on the side because you don't want to shoot the wings. But if the turret is higher, it can rotate all around and shoot at everything. I mean, this is why I put, you know, weaponry turrets on my own spaceship designs, as you can see here. Now there is a condition in which a turret would not be preferable, where you would need the gun forward facing. That means the only way to target the enemy with a gun is that you need to move the ship itself. But for the size of the weapons that we see on most sci-fi ships, they can go on turrets, not a problem. The, the area in which turrets become really problematic on spaceships is when the gun gets too big. Now pretend this is a really, really big gun cannon, okay? And I was housed on the top of this X-Wing. And even if the wings were up, it could still, it can still rotate and not hit the wings. 
This is what would really happen. If you had a gun that was like the third of the mass of the ship itself, when the gun rotates to its side, it's going to push the ship in the opposite direction because every force has an equal and opposite reaction. And so when it moves, the ship is going to go like that. Okay, do you see? <laughs> It'll push the ship in the opposite direction. It won't rotate nearly as much as the turret itself because the turret is smaller mass, but there's enough mass in the ship to actually cause it to rotate that much when you're trying to just rotate it 90 degrees. And you could almost get the ship to rotate 90 degrees if you rotated the top turret 180 degrees. It goes there and suddenly the ship is like that. So it'd be like that. <laughs> I'm not doing it exactly, but it's just to demonstrate the point, okay? Now, even if you had a smaller turret, okay, this is still maybe 10% of the mass of the ship. And so even a gun as big as this could cause issues. When you turn it, want to turn it 90 degrees, you're gonna knock the ship off its course and get it to fly. Now, with maneuvering thrusters, you could counter this, but that is still a problem. I mean, you're certainly ex using a lot more fuel in just trying to, you know, when with a much, much larger gun, and you're moving it there to just get maneuvering thrusters to move it back where it's going so it can rotate independently and freely and aim on, on the targets. But what if you had even a bigger gun? What if the gun was almost half the weight of the entire ship? and you didn't want to waste the fuel in correcting the kind of counter force that is pushing the ship in. Well, the easiest solution then is just to fix the gun on the ship and rotate the ship itself. Because remember, you're using maneuvering thrusters to move the ship back in position when it's getting pushed out of position because of the rotating turret. So you're using fuel anyway, so you might as well just use the fuel to move the whole ship in the direction that you want to fire on. And then you have forward facing guns that require manual targeting and again you would usually want to do that with a computer but if computers are a problem like we were just before you need a human to do it and you have the savvy ace pilot archetype in a situation that's far more realistic now in my opinion you would still have kind of rotating gun turrets point defense you know things on the top and bottom of the ship smaller guns but you could have it that those guns cannot penetrate shields shields are another fictional thing but you know if there's a, if there's shields in this setting they can never penetrate the shield that's why a gun so big is so needed on these ships because that's the only way that you can get through the shields and even the shield can defend it it takes maybe five hits to get through the standard power shields that exist in the sci-fi setting it needs a gun that big and if you need a gun that big you can't have it on a rotating turret it's a kind of i feel that's an elegant solution to get the pilot needing to move the ship in the direction and aim and fire so there we go these are the issues that i was able to figure out when trying to bring in the you know the classic sci-fi dogfighting scenario spaceship dogfighting into the real world and the issues that i could find with it but did i miss any are there any other realistic problems that would come about if you actually tried to make this cool sci-fi element more realistic make spaceships more realistic okay what other problems that would exist in the real world Share them in the comments. I'd love to hear any of the thoughts you have below. I look forward to reading them. And of course, I look forward to seeing you next time. So until then, farewell.